Peace be with you. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Plumas, Manitoba, and this second Sunday in Lent. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with others so that they may hear the Word of God. Last Sunday, I announced that LaRange Lutheran Fellowship Church issued me a divine call. This has been a very difficult and trying week, and I ask that you would keep Zion, LaRange, and myself in your prayers. Please remember that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I record the services of the Word for Sunday and the midweek service for Wednesday. Please continue to watch these services on our YouTube page and our Facebook page as they will supplement what we receive on Sunday mornings in the Divine Service. This Sunday, February 28th, may be the last Sunday that we are together at 10% capacity per service. And I do emphasize May. I don't know what the new health orders will bring, but they will be renewed as of Friday, March the 5th. The chairman, the elders, and I will discuss our options and let you know the times and schedule for the services. The Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you with his grace and favor. The opening hymn is 420, Christ the life of all the living. 420.
the service continues with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant." to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The appointed psalm for today is Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31, and the antiphon being verse 22. Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess the faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing the hymn of the day, 688. Come, follow me, the Savior spake. 688.
Faith, hope, and joy fill your hearts in your believing. Amen. Halfway into the Gospel of St. Mark, Jesus had established his earthly ministry in the northern region of Galilee. Before Jesus and his disciples journeyed toward Jerusalem for our Lord to suffer and die on the cross and rise again from the dead for the life of the world, they continued to travel around the towns and villages of Caesarea Philippi, located at the southwestern base of Mount Hermon, which is northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes to these towns and villages around Caesarea Philippi so that the gospel might be proclaimed among the people there. And like any teacher who makes the most of every opportunity to teach, Jesus asked his disciples as they journeyed, Who do people say that I am? The northern Galilean Jews, for the most part, were willing to recognize that Jesus was a prophet. He was either John the Baptist raised from the dead, or Elijah, or one of the prophets of old like Jeremiah or Isaiah. But the Galilean Jews weren't necessarily willing to accept that Jesus was the prophet whom Moses promised would arise among the brothers in Israel. Like the prophets of old who had been blessed by God to do great and wondrous works, the Galilean Jews identified Jesus to be one of these great prophets. A prophet who at this point in his earthly ministry accomplished great signs, wonders, and miracles, including healing from demons, healing the sick and the lame, calming the storm, raising the dead daughter of Jairus, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, the 4,000, and others. So at the very least, there was no mistaking Jesus to be a prophet of God, for no one could deny these great wonders, signs, and miracles that Jesus had performed before the people. So the people in the northern region, according to the disciples, concluded that Jesus was a prophet, but not necessarily the prophet. So when asked, who do people say that I am? Yes, the disciples said, The Galilean Jews believed you to be a prophet. But in order to dive deeper into his identity as the eternal Son of God, Jesus asked his disciples the question again. But he asks it with a bit of a different twist. He gets a little more personal. He says, who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? Notice the shift. We're not just talking about what people say. What about you, my disciples? Who do you say that I am? This question seems to silence the disciples. They're not too sure what to make of Jesus' identity at this point. Like the Galilean Jews, I'm sure the disciples were all too ready to confess Jesus to be a prophet. But maybe not necessarily the prophet or even the Christ. So St. Peter breaks the silence. And he seems to speak for them all, and he declares, you are the Christ. Jesus is not only the promised prophet, promised by Moses, who we heard about a few weeks ago in the season of Epiphany, but he's the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who came to heal and restore Israel and the world and bring eternal peace and harmony through his death, burial, and glorious resurrection from the dead, that is going to be accomplished in Jerusalem. And like the warning Jesus gave to Peter, James, and John at the Transfiguration, Jesus likewise strictly warns his disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Christ. He warns them not to share this information for the simple fact that he has not yet gone the way of his death, burial, and glorious glorious resurrection. The disciples don't fully understand the message and mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. It had not been accomplished at that point. Therefore, the disciples don't fully understand the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ. They're not yet equipped with God the Holy Spirit to share this message. But once everything is fulfilled, once they receive the power from on high, the gift of God the Holy Spirit, they are commissioned to declare this great good news of Christ crucified 
and risen from the dead for forgiveness and eternal life. But until all these things were accomplished, the disciples were charged not to tell anyone because they did not yet understand who the Christ was and what he had come to do. Baptized, believing, communing Christians, this side of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, can and do confess Jesus to be the Christ, the eternal Son of God, the Savior of the world. Jesus promised that he would suffer many things, that he would be rejected by the religious leaders, and that he would be killed, and after three days rise again from the dead in order to bring about forgiveness and eternal life for you and all people. So by all means, we need to share this great good news of the gospel with all people, with family members and friends, with neighbors and co-workers. We who have the benefit of hearing and knowing the fullness of the gospel, of receiving this gospel, of experiencing this gospel in word and sacraments, can go out and tell others about Jesus. We want to share this message with others who do not know who Jesus is or who do not understand who Jesus is, that he came into this world to save sinners and we all qualify. And remember, your confession of Jesus Christ is confirmed in his word and teaching. Whereas the apostles, when asked who Jesus was, were uncertain. Consider Jesus' question to the disciples, who do you say that I am. They weren't necessarily sure. And even Peter, who said you are the Christ, wasn't necessarily sure about what all that meant. Although he confessed Jesus to be the Christ, he certainly lacked the understanding of what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ. Because when Jesus explains to the disciples that the Christ must first go the way of suffering and the cross, before his glorious resurrection from the dead, Peter, who had just confessed Jesus to be the Christ, took him aside and rebuked him for saying such a thing. You should never go the way of the cross. He thought the Messiah would reign eternally. So immediately before all the disciples, Jesus exposes the thoughts of Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Wow, Peter had misunderstood what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ. So much so that Jesus says Peter was under the influence of Satan. Satan, the old evil foe, does not want Jesus to go the way of the cross and suffering because in that day, Jesus will fulfill the words and promises of God and he will defeat Satan the world, and our own sinful passions of the flesh, and he will bring everlasting life and forgiveness to us by his death and and resurrection. And the devil certainly does not want that. The devil wants us to take us away from Jesus, the Christ, his cross, and his eternal life. A few weeks ago, during the Feast of the Transfiguration, I had mentioned that we sometimes avoid the cross. Sometimes we ignore the cross of Jesus and we want to get right to the glory and the resurrection of Jesus. In my experience, there has always been more in attendance on Easter Sunday, which is the celebration of Jesus' resurrection, than that of Good Friday, which is the commemoration of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross for our sin and the sin of the world. Why? Good Friday is not complete without Easter Sunday, and Easter Sunday has no meaning without Good Friday. You cannot have a bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ without the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And believe it or not, there are some Christian congregations who don't even have a Good Friday service. I cannot imagine. If there is no death of Jesus Christ on the cross, then it certainly follows there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A crossless, Christless Christianity is a useless Christianity. It is a message that is trivial at best and sentimental to our feelings and sinful desires at worst. A crossless, Christless Christianity will affirm 
and tolerate our sin and iniquities, and quite frankly, it will be completely and totally irrelevant to our lives. Without Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, Christianity is doomed. It simply becomes another practical philosophy among many others, a message of moralism and self-help, a religion of the law without the fullness of the gospel. Lord, have mercy. And unfortunately, it is not just so-called Christian congregations who promote this empty message of Christianity. Any one of us can get caught up in a Christless, crossless Christianity when we shut our ears and our hearts to the call to repentance from our sin and wretchedness. When we embrace our sin and wretchedness rather than have it forgiven in Jesus Christ's cross so that we can have his forgiveness that he earned, that's when we ignore the cross. We need to amend our sinful lives and live to the honor and praise of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The call to repentance is not to make our life miserable, but a call to return to the Lord who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, who promises to forgive all our sin and wretchedness by his death on the cross. Jesus said to his apostles today that he came into the world in order to suffer many things, and this he did. He came to suffer on the cross for all our sin and wretchedness. And the great good news of the gospel is that Jesus took all that sin and wretchedness into his body to death on the cross. He suffered and died so that we might be forgiven and have everlasting life through his resurrection from the dead. Without Christ and his cross, there is no forgiveness, life, and salvation. Satan, the evil foe, has a desire to deceive you into thinking that Christianity is that practical, self-help, moralistic philosophy. That notion, my treasured ones, is the thoughts of sinful man. That is not the thoughts of God. That is not the way of God. To the contrary, Christianity is all about Jesus Christ, his cross, his death, his burial, his glorious resurrection and ascension for us and our salvation. Therefore, do not be tempted by the devil, the world, or our own misunderstandings of Jesus and his mission. We need not be tempted to believe in a crossless, Christless Christianity. Rather, we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he won and earned for you by dying and rising again in Jerusalem. Therefore, in the words of Jesus, we take up our own cross and follow him through daily self-denial for the sake of the gospel. As you continue to live under the cross and take up your cross, you are promised eternal life, not to earn or gain or achieve eternal life through your efforts, but an eternal life given through Jesus' cross for our sin, his resurrection from the dead for our eternal life. For the cross that we carry reminds us of the holy cross of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins that he won on the cross for us. By the cross that we carry, through the pains and evils, the wounds and weaknesses, the sicknesses and diseases we suffer in this world of death and sin, we are forced to remember the cross of Jesus Christ for us and our salvation. Our cross is actually to drive us to the cross of Jesus, who has overcome all these things in his atoning death on the cross and his glorious resurrection from the dead. Our life is healed. It is restored. It is saved eternally because Jesus has taken up his cross for us and won forgiveness and salvation. Jesus has reversed the curse of sin and death by his own dying and rising again for you and all people so that you may never lose your life. Therefore, boldly confess Jesus saving life, death, burial, and glorious resurrection from the dead to all who do not know Jesus as the Christ or understand him and his message of eternal salvation through his death and resurrection from the dead. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. 
working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing the Offertory Canticle 781. We give thee but thy own. 781. pray to God, crying out for His mercy, confident that our Father hears our prayers because His Son Jesus died on the cross for us and rose again from the dead for us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, continue to establish your saving covenant with us as you did with Abraham that we who surely deserve nothing from you may rely on you for everything. While we were still your enemies at the right time, you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Grant us repentant hearts and faith that rejoices that his death and resurrection has reconciled us to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father in heaven, Look with your kindness upon all who hold public office in our land and country. Fill them with your wisdom, especially during this COVID-19 crisis and as they make decisions on our behalf. Give them both courage and compassion and make them a blessing to us and all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father in heaven, Be with those who pass through difficult times and know sickness or headache, loneliness and despair, including all that we name silently at this moment. Heal each and every one as you know best. Provide for those who lack financial resources, home, or the basic necessities of life. In every time of testing, teach your children to hold tightly to you in faith, that in the end, 
they may know the comfort of your eternal love in our Savior Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father in heaven, you know the many temptations with which the world would snare us and draw us away from our trust in you. Set our minds not on the things of man, but on the things of God. Grant each of us a faith that confesses with joy that Jesus is indeed the Christ. And also give us faith to daily deny ourselves, to take up our crosses and follow him. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who proclaim Jesus here and throughout the world. Bring those who do not know or trust his love also to believe and rejoice in the reconciliation our Savior accomplished for us and all people by his blood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father in heaven, prepare the hearts of those who receive Christ's body and blood this day. With our Savior in us through this Holy Eucharist, grant us a peace that rejoices even in sufferings. By your gracious working, let those sufferings produce endurance in us, and let endurance produce character, and let character produce the hope that is never ashamed because you have poured out your love into our hearts through God the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father in heaven, your Son promises deliverance from all evil. Receive our thanks for the victory over death and the grave that he won for us by his death and resurrection. Bring us with all your saints to celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom that has absolutely no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, Father, we place ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. We'll sing our final hymn, 425, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. 425.
You can find and follow Zion Lutheran Church Plumas on Facebook under Zion Lutheran or on our open Facebook page called Zion's Sermons. Please like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.